Stillwater Fever Dog 73 Tour Bus. It's the Digi Gods. And now, please welcome two Bellbottom Golden Gods singing Tiny Dancer, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. <laughs> That was sent in by Mario Mendez, who is by now almost famous. See what I did? Oh, uh, that was a. See what he did? He called back. Wade. The movie. Wade. Yeah. Welcome back, Mark. You know what I'm doing right now? Instead of paying attention to what you're saying, I invented a hashtag for you. It was hashtag Loverboy. What? Yeah. Based, no one. No one based, used it. Based on what? The fact that you know you're you're romancing on both sides of the Atlantic. You're Loverboy. It is true. I was in Paris last uh, 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 three weeks ago. No, I was in Paris. Four weeks ago, whenever it was, yeah. And my girlfriend was in was here two weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, and uh, she's not voting for Le Pen. <laughs> Why? Putting it out there. Um. Anyway, how uh, so? How uh, how how have you been? Well, Paris I've good? been. The, the, Paris the, is great. You know what? Yeah. Paris is the best. It is, isn't it? I really would like to move there. <laughs> if I get a job, I would move there. You know, uh, I mean, I wouldn't sell my home and give up everything I own and go to Paris. But if I got a job, I'd go. And speaking of after uh, after all the uh, making fun of me about uh, Colcoa, this and that and so forth, who's on the Colcoa jury this year? That'd be me. That's right. No, here's it? the thing. So it's fun, uh, isn't it? So Wade has been on the. Um, the jury of the City of Light, City of Angels Film Festival. A, a, and it's funny, it's an exclusively French film festival, mm -hmm. but this year there's two Italian films. Well, they started, it started getting more international last year already. And uh, it's, it, I think it just speaks to the way the French film industry, more foreign directors are making French films, more French films are being shot in other countries, you know, Mustang, Dupont, they, they're dealing with issues that are relative to other cultures as, as France becomes a much more international hub, you know? So, I mean, I just think that's the natural evolution of French cinema. So I, I talked to the, uh, uh, the program director, right? Yeah, Francois. Francois. And I said, look, I would like to do it. I would love to do it. First of all, because it would be fun. Mm -hmm. Second of all, because as a guy with a French girlfriend who's trying to move to France, it would be like a little thing. It's another little notch in my, uh, my French bedpost, right? Yeah. To be able to talk to French people, <laughs> maybe French employers, French yeah. film people. Hey, I was on a film jury for a cold call. Oh, yeah, yeah. French. Oh, you. So they would, they would understand that I, I, I like France. I get France, whatever. Yeah. But I had to let him know that, I mean, it's 30 films in two weeks. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, can I not see a film? Can I not show up to the festival? Like, what's the minimum I can do to be an effective juror? And and it is it is as you are finding out the jury is kind of an organism you know you you talk to other jurors people will watch a movie and go oh this was a terrible movie or you even talk to people just in advance and you will get a sense that at least half of those thirty films w don't have a shot in hell of getting a consensus from your jury well so you may as well just excise half of them right out of the gate well Francois was nice enough to give us I think four films that. He's like, these will never win ever in the entire world. Don't yeah. even bother. Yeah. Including Raid, Special Unit. Yeah. That horrible Danny Boone film. Which I didn't dislike. I, I actually, I mean, it's one of his lesser films. Uh, and, that and woman she, was and terrible. Where did he get <laughs> it? He, he, he must be sleeping with her because he's t she's she, terrible. She, uh, I think she's a bit of a thing in France at the moment. Um, but, uh, yeah, she's no Melissa McCarthy. That's oh, they, they, the Fran French need <laughs> Melissa McCarthy. They do. So I've watched... Um, Probably twenty five films. I've got yeah. another couple. I, I, I'm actually coming in for a landing. I think I'm by tomorrow. I think I will have watched everything. And then Monday we get to, we're going to get together. Yeah. At some Persian restaurant in Westwood. Yep. Which is equidistant between the folks who live in Santa Monica and the jury members who live in the, in the Valley. We'll get together in some Persian restaurant and in Westwood, which is the town where UCLA yeah. is. In Westwood, there's a strip of per very good Persian restaurants. It's it's a uh, yeah, it's Little Persia. It's so great. we'll meet meet at one of those, and then just do whatever Bob Kohler wants. You realize my daughter's favorite food is Persian food, like she asks for it every week. You go here. What are you hungry for? Persian food. Four year old asking for Persian food. And you give it to her, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. We go to Daria, and I and I grab some uh, some juicy chicken. carnival. Juicy chicken? No, carnival is is Lebanese. She loves that too. She loves that too. 
Anything from the Fertile Crescent general area, Middle East. She loves. She's like her parents. She loves Middle Eastern food. So we've. I, I've seen uh, one or two really uh, terrific films. A lot of blah and a couple of bad ones. Yeah, and and uh, I know you loved uh, a, a woman's story. Uh, I I think a woman's life is, is going to win. A woman's life, yes. A, a, a life. woman's life is going to win. Yeah. I, uh, Bob loves St- it. I love it. Stéphane Brise, who wrote and directed, of course, did Memoirs of Chambon and A Few Hours of Spring and uh, the uh, you know the the last Vincent Landon film that won him Best Actor at Cannes, and you know, he worked with Vincent Landon three times in a row. Uh, Brise is amazing, and he, and I uh, he, he had two events. I I moderated. He's honestly he's been on three events at Colcoa this week. I moderated two of them. Lael, who was on Film Week with me yesterday, moderated the uh, uh, Woman's uh, Life event, and he's just delightful. He is. I I did a um, you know they screened his second film, which is also beautiful, and we did a whole hour after that, and the audience just loved him. He's just he's so charming. He's so incredibly charming. There's a um. There might be a ground. Did, did hmm. you watch Slack Bay, the Bruno Dumont movie? Yes, I watched Slack <laughs> Bay. Had to talk about that on so, Film Week yesterday too. So Slack Bay is essentially if if Monty Python made a made a Tati film, yeah, it would be Slack Bay. Yeah, I didn't like it. You know why? No one likes it because after like an hour and forty five minutes, you're like, I get it, you're weird. <laughs> I get it. Okay, move on. Well, that's the thing with Bruno Dumont. You know, Bruno. See, I moderated the Meet, the Meet the Delegation panel this year, which is where, you know, you have all the, as many people as you can cluster together on one panel who are, you know, have films there. And, and I have to sort of manage 50 minutes and make sure everybody gets their, their piece of 50 minutes. And it's pretty intimidating because you've got basic, I mean, I think I had six or seven people up on stage with two translators. So, you know, it chews up time pretty quickly and you got to give people their due. And um, the last time I did it was about four or five years ago, the last time Bruno had a film there. And my first question, Bruno used to insult everyone else on the panel. Now, the translator, Robin, was at the other end, and she and I looked at each other and looked at the French speakers in the front row with this look of panic, like, what do we do? This is going south fast. And Robin somehow, she translated gold and took all the venom out of it. Wait, so what what did the guy say? Oh, he's something to the effect of, you know, uh, it's, uh, you know, when you're the only person up on this stage who's a real artist. It was something that something like that. It was sort of like. Was he being cheeky or funny? Was no, he trying to Bruno be just? Is, a... Bruno is Bruno. He just that's who he is. And this week, and I agreed to do it again because I thought, well, I haven't done it for a few years. I think I got that out of my system. And then I found out Bruno was on the panel again. I thought, oh no, here we go again. And you know, he was on he was on his best behavior this year. He sat there and he did he kind of brooded a little bit. But you know, Claude Lelouch was there. And he, he's very self-effacing. And everybody else, including Brise and the other filmmakers, they were all just saying, well, we wouldn't be here if not for Lelouch. And they were sort of laying wreaths at his feet, and he was all sort of embarrassed. And, you know, it was so it was a big Lelouch love session. And Bruno just kind of sat there very broodingly and dealt with it. And uh, Lelouch- then, then he said a nice thing about Lelouch himself. So that was all good. Lelouch, who has a film at the festival. Yeah, Lelouch is... It's, it's fun, man. I like his film. I do, too. Well, I- we wouldn't give it anything, but yeah. we like it. It, it, it's a it's a fun film. So anyway, open at night, Mr. and Mrs. Edelman. Yeah. Stuff maybe you've heard of. So Mark, before we get on with the show, I'm having a breakfast crisis. Gods at digigods.com. Email us your suggestions. Gods at digigods.com. I'm having a midlife breakfast crisis. So I'm not going to have cereal anymore because it's too caloric and sugary and processed. Um, you know, waffles too too carby to have every single day. Same with pancakes. I gain weight if I do that. Don't want to do that. Um, uh, you know, bacon and sausages. I don't. I don't eat beef or pork, so there's none of that unless it's turkey based, and I, that will get tiresome very quickly. And uh, there's really, I mean, you know, I, there's really nothing else. The eggs. I love eggs, but I can't have eggs every day. So I don't know what to have for breakfast anymore. You know what Severine does when she's here? Huh? Is what she does. In fact, you're seeing it a little bit. Yeah. Bread. Yeah. Put some butter. Yeah. Honey on top. Yeah. Tea. Some kind of fruit. The end. It's not a bad idea. I think I'll, I, I, I might do that. I, I made some uh, crepes the other day. I didn't do them as well as I think Severine does them, but uh, I was quite happy with how I, I did them. But do you have a crepe pan from France? Uh, not from France, but I do have a crepe pan. Yeah, mine's from France. <laughs> Brought over by a French woman in her luggage. <laughs> All right, well, let's get on with this. Uh, let's get on with this crazy show. Um. Yeah. So, um. Uh. What's What's happened in the last week or so? It's it, the movie. The Rockford Files is on Blu-ray. Right. Come on. Totally. I could not believe on the Rockford Files that every week was a different message on his machine. 
Yeah. By the way, when the show started like 10 minutes ago, yeah. w- w- before we spent 10 minutes yeah. talking about crap that yeah. the listener doesn't care about, yeah. I was on Amazon yeah. buying, pre-ordering Blu-ray Heat. Yeah, a Warner film that's coming out from Fox now because of all that weird Regency right stuff. Which, Very by the way, you probably have and are not going to give me. No, I haven't gotten it yet. I'm going to buy it. it. So anyway, uh, the first thing out of the gate, just want to make mention, because they sent this to us, and we know we have a lot of people who uh, are big fans of wrestling. So the WWE book of top tens, title matches, epic rivalries, finishing moves, and much more. This is kind of an excuse just to throw a lot of uh, wrestling stuff into a, a, a semi-soft cover book. It, it's, you know, it's, it's, this is a coffee table book for people to just laugh at. Uh, it, you know, like, Mark, come on, look, look at the graphics. Somebody had a lot of fun with this, right? I don't know why they even Every make page those. You can go online and get the same information. Yeah, but it's like put it's on a coffee table. It's to put on a coffee table. It's just for, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a thing. It, why not? For fans. Put a coffee a, table in your double wide? You know, what if, the, what if the electricity goes out? Then you can't go online. Then you've got to resort to, to ancient primitive things like books. Well, yeah. Well, they're, they're, And, of course, they're, they're, they're not reading Madame Bovary. Yeah. They're reading at WW. By the way, I'm reading Madame Bovary right now. Are you? I am. A lot, of, simil- a lot of similar- similarities with the Brise film, with uh, De Maupassant. Oh, huh? with with a, a, a woman's life. Yeah, there are certain similarities. Yeah, although Bovary does the cheating. Yes, but the in in terms of that Victorian era literature from France and England, oh, yeah. where you know, like Persuasion in the UK by uh, J, by uh, Jane Austen is sort of in there. So is uh, uh, Jane Eyre a little bit. You know, uh, I mean, the Brontes in Austen and Maupassant, and they all sort of are doing the same thing. Bovary, right? They're all they're all kind of in the same it's general good. area. Yeah, it's a good it's great. It's great. I, I I bought it Shakespeare and Son. It's never. Oh, I love that store. That store's been there forever. Uh, you know, it's funny. I went there. I had before I went. That's been there since before Shakespeare. You know that. What? It was. A, it's not named for him. It's named for uh, f- uh for uh, Steve Fran- Shakespeare. Francois Shakespeare. No, it's not. Yeah. When I, uh, the first time I went to France in 1989, I was a kid. Okay. Um, I went to Shakespeare and Son. Yeah. And I thought, oh, it's the same. It looks the same. Yeah. There you go. All right, so let's uh, start off on new movies, Mark. Got a bunch of stuff. Here. We do have a bunch of stuff, and I think the uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go on record as saying the uh, the reconnaissance is over. The what? Mis- oh yeah, it is the reconnaissance. Is that what they were calling it? Yes, okay. because he came from nowhere. He was like right. a he was like a douchebag for right. years, and now suddenly he's uh, he's ma'am. Yeah. Okay. And um, the reconnaissance uh, officially ended with gold. Which yeah. was directed by Stephen Gagan, who's, uh, you know, I mean, look, the guy wrote Traffic. Did you dislike this movie? Huh? Did you dislike this movie? Yeah, kind of, because I think he's, I think McConaughey, you know what it is? The problem is that See, I, I, was looking, I was looking at him like, a, like, l- like an actor again, yeah. worth admiring. Yeah. And then over the course of this movie, mainly because he's like bald for half of it, yeah. I started to look at him like a douchebag again. <laughs> he was turning back to what he was. See, I, I think, because it's a true story. For those who don't know, this is uh, set in the uh, 70s, right? It's 1970s, early 80s. Wasn't that the time frame? So it's, uh, it's the story of a, a mining scandal. And I know you think, oh, great, mining scandal. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's a really interesting um, bit of history. And Matthew McConaughey plays this guy who's basically like a modern-day prospector. He's always working the deals on, you know, this mine of that, you know, this ore or something or other. And gold, of course, is the grail. But, you know, it doesn't have to be gold. It could be copper. It could be, you know, anything. Uh, there's just lots of money in any mine. If you can find a mine somewhere, you can make money off it. And so, you know, he's a guy who's just working the angles. And uh, then he and um, uh, Edgar Ramirez, who plays this guy who, you know, allegedly found the greatest all-time strike of copper, um, they wind up becoming partners and... Hit it big. And then there is this amazing sort of political quagmire that ensues. And I found it interesting, but I also found it somehow missing the mark. And I'm still not quite sure why it missed the mark. Was it not saying uh, politically or morally what you wanted it to say? No. No, I, it just, I felt like I was watching a movie that was just barely missing being an awards contender. And, and it was bugs, it the script? It, well, you know, maybe, you know what, maybe the script I, I was, not, was not pointed enough. I don't know. It's, 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 it bugs me because I'm watching it and I'm thinking this should be working, but it's not. And, I'm, and I, to this day, I'm still not quite sure 
why it just barely misses the mark. Maybe because he's involved in an industry that is not is not it, it doesn't grab you. You don't want to know what it's like to be in that industry. So even though you find it I don't interesting, know. I don't know. I honestly, I don't. I don't know. I'm still, I'm still trying to figure it out. It's very because that hap- This happens to me like maybe two or three times a year where I'll see a film and I'll go, um, oh, why don't I like this more? And I don't know. Because I the, want you know, to, uh, but I don't. Maybe there's just not an, not enough of a sense of urgency to it. Yeah. Well. That might be. You know, that might be it. Maybe there's not enough of a sense of urgency to it. Maybe. It, anyway. does, it doesn't feel like an important story. The you like it better if you listen to the commentary. The Gagan commentary is is quite good. Gagan's a, he, he gives good good talk. Um, some interesting little backstories to this thing too, which are always nice to listen to. There's deleted sequence, which is negligible, and then the uh, the other feature red's not really into it. Um, you know, I'm I'm gonna keep fighting to try to like this because I feel like I should like it more. I don't. It makes me feel guilty. Uh, rings. I don't know why they felt they had to do this. You know, Rings was originally supposed to come out on Friday the 13th last year, and then uh, they bumped it at the last minute. I was on radio that day, and I remember we were looking forward. I was like, okay, great, another Ring, you know, another Ringu movie, except this one is not based on any J-horror film. This is now a a fully original American uh, Ring movie. And uh, then they bumped it. I thought, "Uh uh-oh. And it was Friday the 13th. What better time to release it? And there was nothing left. There were no, I mean, when was the last time you had a Friday the 13th where there was no major horror film being released? It used to be like a Saw film sure. every single time. And, uh, and they bumped it, and I thought, that's a bad sign. And, of course, you know, now that we're in the age of, of YouTube, the resonance of uh, the, the idea of a videotape. Oh, there's a videotape, and it's, to put, like, it's, it's evil and possessed and opens up a portal. It doesn't really carry any... Uh, resonance no. anymore it's like well can i watch it on youtube so they've tried to go to a social media place which is oh my gosh like if you watch it on youtube everyone it's, 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 it's go, terrible it, it's it's not you know good. You, know, you know that movie uh, i didn't see it but the circle the tom hanks emma watson thing so I, I, I did i had to talk about it on radio yesterday i just did you see it no it's okay. just uh, who wants to see a movie about the it, it, it feels so, like the, like the, like Sandra Bullock's the net or these like it, let me or, tell or you. Chris Evans cellular let me these cautionary you. tales that well, are just trying well, to well let me tell you latch I, themselves onto a new technology I will I will interrupt this uh, new movie spiel for, for a quick recap of what Lael and I said yesterday and we both felt the same way about it which is that um, it, it is it's just loaded with contrivances and it ties itself up in the in the like fastest tidiest most unbelievably impossible to believe thing at the end and there's a little character turn in the middle that makes no sense the whole thing is not very well constructed it's based on a novel it's not well constructed it's a bit of a mess as a script however um it is it is effective despite that because the idea of this woman who goes to work for this giant company that's basically like if you took if you took Apple and Google and Facebook and you just mashed them all together and you go to work for that company and you think oh this is a great place and then you discover you've basically gone to work for the Manson family uh, the and and you realize that social media almost too late you realize that social media is being used not as a way of bringing the world together but of taking over every institution and every vestige of our lives and our privacy um, you kind of suddenly look at your whole social media activity and you want to you want to cleanse you want to shower but it, it, it does it, seem like it just seems like a B movie from the 90s yeah kind of I mean it look it's not even that it's more like Soylent Green or Logan's Run or uh, it's a little bit of two thousand. It's it's very Crichton-y, right? You know, we've we've invented it's fr- it's Frankenstein, as filtered through Crichton's instincts, uh, invented for the internet generation. That's what it is. You know, we've made a monster. No, but it's it's a great thing. No, it's a monster. And then when it's too late, you go, oh my gosh, I've I've made a monster. The internet is the monster. That's all it is. Um. Okay. Uh. Did you want me to send you the Odyssey? Can I do that? Uh. Yeah, we'll do that later. Can I do it? Is that like... I don't know. No, no, you can do it. I mean, my link isn't working, so... Well, I'll send you mine. Yeah, that's fine. Beautiful. I'll do it right now. All right. While you're talking about some crap movie I don't care about. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, Dog's Purpose. Oh, my goodness Doggies. gracious. Ah, uh, Dog's Purpose. Oh, this so, one has some, this, this one ran into some problems. Oh, did it ever. You know, so Lassie Hallstrom became a big deal because he made an amazing Swedish film called My Life as a Dog. And then he had a great Hollywood career, and he got nominated for an Oscar a few times and some Best Picture nominees, and then everything went south. And he is now straight to video schmaltzy man. And he made A Dog's Purpose, which is so far from My Life as a Dog. Because My Life as a Dog is not really about a dog. It's about a kid. 
Dog's Purpose is literally about a dog. Doggy. It's not just about a dog. It's about a dog who reincarnates as other dogs Doggy. every time he dies. And every time he dies, he reincarnates as a new dog with a new owner. And you go through these episodes until, oh, he comes back around to his original owner, who was a really good kid originally. And when that kid grows up, he grows up to be dead as Quaid. And it gets all pointing and weepy at the end. Spoiler and alert. I, well, but everybody knows this. And I love Britt Robertson. Britt Robertson is great. And she is wonderful. And uh, the thing is that this movie just doesn't hang together because some of the episodes are shorter than others. Some are more conclusive than others. Some are more meaningful than others. It just, it, it, there's just, you're treading water. It just, it, it, it leans too heavily. And normally dog movies are infectious because you fall in love with the dog. But this is like five dogs. And uh, the narration doesn't really work, uh, you know, the, because that's the one thing that ties it together is that you've, you've got uh, uh, Josh Gad doing the narration. And I can't, I can't fall in love with Josh Gad's voice, you know, because he's LeFou. So it's just... Your problem is you hate Christmas. <laughs> anyway, so that's a dog's purpose. Blu-ray DVD combo set, almost nothing by way of extras. They they got a, you know they, they just kind of threw the EPK on here, and that was it. Now, it, is there is there a ultraviolet? Fe- is there a featurette about how they almost killed a dog? No. Okay. Read about it if you didn't know about it. Yeah, that that was the uh, that was the thing. The, the trainer who you know tried to shove the dog back in the water and. <laughs> It got it, it, and then look. I yes, that hurt the film for a moment, but it it was never going to do. It was never going to perform. I think if anything, that controversy may have boosted its opening weekend numbers a little and hurt its long term numbers. So I think it was a wash. Um, a couple other lame ones here. I'm going to get out of the way real quickly. The autopsy of Jane Doe. Uh, I this is an IFC midnight film. Almost all it takes place entirely in a. Um, in this really spooky, haunty, creepy coroner's office uh, where you are basically sentenced to to sit for the longest time with Brian Cox and Emil Hirsch. Brian Cox and Emil Hirsch, father and son, uh, coroners, <coughs> doing a dissection. This movie's not bad. It's actually more effective than you would no, think. It's more effective than you would think, but it, it, it wasn't great. I mean, you know, it, it directed by uh, Andre Urvadal, uh, who wanted this, who was a, a Norwegian director, I believe, and uh, wanted a, a horror film for his American English language debut. And uh, this was what they chose, I guess, because it was low budget. But the idea that there's like this creepy, gothic, uh, you know, coroner's office, and it's it, it just, you know, out in the way back behind their house, in the middle of nowhere, where it's impossible to get to, it's just it's sort of like the the haunted house contrivance, except with the, with a uh, a morgue or a uh, not a morgue, but you know the coroner's office. Anyway, it um, the idea is that they've got this woman, her body was unearthed in this uh, in this one building, and it's like she was you know nothing has nothing has happened. There's no indication of foul play with her body. And so they perform an autopsy on her, and she's just a Jane Doe. But, of course, there's a history to this woman and to this body, and that opens up this whole kind of spooky, supernatural past. And, uh, you know, the next thing you know, bodies are coming alive and all kinds of hell is breaking loose, literally. And, uh, you know, whatever. I, I mean, it's, it's got its spooky scares, but I, the whole premise is just so ridiculous. And it's so contrived to just be in one place. And I've seen too many of those horror films lately, where they're just, oh, you know what? We have a we have an old and abandoned warehouse. Can we can we think up some crap idea that so we can shoot the whole thing in a warehouse? Okay, fine. And then Monster Trucks on Blu-ray, Blu-ray DVD, and uh, Ultraviolet combo set. Uh, this is truly horrendous. Uh, I I just this is awful. Um, did you did you see this, Mark? No, because it looked. Terrible. It looks it, like a big dud. But look how they packaged it. Oh my gosh, it's awful. They packaged it like it's a, you know, like a, it's like it's big trouble, little China or something. Yeah. No, this is this is really absolutely terrible. Uh, this is a truly terrible movie. I, I guess they aimed this at kids or something. They thought that this would be like a little boy's version. Rob Lowe's in this, by the way. I don't know why. I guess they threw a lot of money at him. Boat payments. I don't know. Maybe they thought this would be like a little boy's version of the Fast and the Furious, but it's not. It's just terrible. So I, you know, a bunch of special features on here, but again, it's mostly EPK stuff. I wouldn't waste my time. Uh, Wade, uh, the uh, uh, De Niro, 
Remember when we used to love De Niro? Yeah, why is he doing stuff like this? I don't know. And, and you know, and, and every time De Niro does something like The Comedian, you think, maybe he's on to something. Maybe this is the one time where he's actually going to do something we care about. Yeah, no. And it turns out to be just another De Niro. I guess he's got... I, I, I don't know. You, know. you think maybe he wants to work with young directors, but it's directed by Taylor Hackford, who ain't young. Nope. And uh, you're like, maybe he wants to work with Leslie Mann, or maybe he's buddies with Danny DeVito. You don't know why. Taylor Hackford's just phoning it in these days. I know. Anyway, so, so De Niro plays a, uh, he plays a, a stand-up comic, and uh, he winds up uh, falling in love with um, this woman played by Leslie Mann. And, you know, the uh, there was something there about De Niro... Using his, you know, old school raging bull, not given f sort of delivery to be a stand up comic, but the whole thing is just forced and flimsy, and it's just it's too long, and it's just plot cliches everywhere. And I just think that unless you're like, you know, really your grandparents' age, you're just not going to kick get a kick out of this at all. I just think it's, I just I just think it's just not very good. So I, I you know, I, it's hard to say why De Niro does a film. I think De Niro does a film just because it's, it's Tuesday. Yeah. And let's do a film. Because <laughs> I don't think he's reading anything. I don't think he's reading the script. Um, so I'd pass on that. So Bigger, Fatter, Liar is uh, with Ricky Garcia, uh, Jodell Ferland, and Barry Boswick. Barry Boswick. Oh, my God. I know, right? Where's he been? He's, he, Barry Boswick has a lot of gray hair now. Yeah, he does. He was once George Washington. Remember when he played George Washington on TV? No. Okay, well, he did. You remember when he was in uh, he Mega, was like he a, was in Megaforce? Yeah, well, that's cool. <laughs> Megaforce is cool. <laughs> no, it's not. Why not? <laughs> because they shoot SD's rockets off of the fronts of motorcycles. It's ridiculous. Anyway, so the whole idea is that this is that uh, uh, Ricky plays this 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 kid, and he's he came up with this amazing idea for a, and so Barry Boswick is the is the video game producer who steals it from him. So the kid decides to get his revenge. And, uh, you know, what, what are you going to say? It's just terrible. I, I, I guess if you're 15 years old and you love video games and you want to see, like, you know, your dad tied to a chair, you, you might think it's funny. But otherwise, Bigger, Fat, or Liar is just, just yeah. not good. Yep. Also not good is uh, Sleepless with Jamie Foxx and Michelle Monaghan. What happened to you know, Michelle Monaghan? What happened to Jamie Foxx? I know. Why is he doing this? I don't know. You know why? He's probably doing it because it's his movie. It's, it, this yeah. is his movie. It's like, Jamie, here's the thing. It's uh, directed by uh, Baron Bo Ardor, who is some guy <laughs> okay. who directed a film that no one cares about, but he's cool. And and it's going to be a big release, and you star, and you're in every uh. single scene, man. And it's about corrupt cops. Re remember how Denzel Washington won an Oscar for Training Day playing a corrupt cop? That's you. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Jamie plays a corrupt cop. And, uh, yeah, a bunch of gangsters kidnap his son, and he spends all night trying to find his uh, son. Really, he should not this – is, this is a B-movie programmer just inflated into some A-list stratosphere by virtue of the way it's shot, who it stars, the money behind it, and it doesn't even remotely deserve it. I mean, Jamie Foxx just sits there and mutters and glowers and – and it's just a, a lot of plot holes, listless. It's just not great. It's just not a great movie. And I don't know why he's doing this sort of a movie. Makes no sense. Mm. Makes no sense. All right. And uh, I got a couple of low-budget thrillers here. Just make quick mention of The Watcher uh, is a, uh, is a, a you know, I guess it's, it's it, this is from Monarch. They uh, they release a lot of straight to video stuff. It's uh, this is uh, this is okay. I it, I'm tr I keep trying to think of other horror films, other uh, thrillers that sort of uh, tread in this same territory, and it's kind of like all of them. There's just too many that do it. Uh, it's you know people they buy they buy a home. They think oh my gosh it's a wonderful wonderful house. And as we all know, uh oh something happened in the house. Something's haunting the house. Uh, so it's. You know, it's that thing again. Um, Amityville Horror. I mean, you name it. Every haunted house on the hill. It's just on and on and on. So uh, it takes a couple of interesting twists. But uh, otherwise, really, the only reason to see this is because Denise Crosby's in it. And uh, then The Shadow Effect. Uh, Jonathan Rhys Myers uh, making a, taking a payday for some strange reason, I guess. He doesn't have to do this. It's directed by the Brothers Olsen. Don't know who they are. Uh, far too many brother teams making movies these days. Have you noticed that? 
Yeah, but the Hughes brothers, they don't make movies anymore. No, they don't. But we have, the, we have like, the Duffer brothers who did the no, Netflix well, the, thing. I'm good with that, but it's like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing just so many brother teams making movies. It's very, it's very strange. Like the Coens and the Tavianis unleashed a storm, and now every every pair of brothers thinks they're going to go make a couple of movies. You're, you, like the like me. the Marvel guys. The the the, the oh, they're good. It? They are good, aren't they? By the way, I saw Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, how is it? I haven't seen it yet. I've been too busy. Hey, it's good. It's, it's more of the same. I mean, the the, the the problem is when you feel obligated. To not only give you the same, but give you more of the same. Yeah. The seventy fifth time that Rocket Raccoon is annoyed at uh, at Chris Pratt, <laughs> it just gets to be it, it just gets to be tiresome. But that said, but Groot is little now. He's so cute. But <laughs> See, I, that's a fun change. It is. But I, you know, he, what's funny about I the am Marvel Groot. films? <laughs> what's funny about the Marvel films, which I find interesting, is that they're very good at character. Like they'll decide to make this character change. Like he goes from villain to hero. Yeah. Or he dies. Something where just when you think you're about to be tired of a character, or just when you think that the character only has one, he has only one note, they switch it up. So right. you don't get tired of the characters. Like in this film, characters die that you never thought would die. In this film, characters turn, right. turn allegiances that you wouldn't think. Okay. So you're always a little bit engaged. So yes, even though it's a little bit tiresome and you're just tired of seeing the, 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 the explosions and the one-liners and the whatever, I, I like that. It. It's, 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 the Guardian films have, have staked their claim in this little tiny expletive inflected corner of the Marvel universe, and they just frolic there and they love it. Yeah, and that's okay. Yeah, you know, so it's, it's good. Uh, so anyway, the shadow effect. Uh, Jonathan Rhys Meyers plays uh, a scientist, kind of a mad scientist type guy, but he's a well-meaning mad scientist. And uh, Cam Gigande plays this guy who is who's having dreams that are hauntingly, pr- like haunting premonitions of political assassinations. And uh, there, he, you know, Jonathan Reese Myers is trying to research on him, and, and, and then it gets really weird, and then it gets very kind of uh, it cr- mixes up Frankenstein. We got a lot of that this week. Mixes up Frankenstein a little bit with uh, the uh, uh, the. Um, yeah, you're you're looking at me. No, with with the, uh, the Manchurian Candidate. Okay, thank you. So anyway. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's a little bit uh, too high concept for its own good. It's trying a little bit too hard. Michael Bean is in this as well. He he and his wife just do all kinds of junk these days. Anyway, uh, not uh, not much here. But uh, if you you know, it's not terrible. It's just convoluted uh, shadow effect. That and the Watcher. Wait, uh, Resurrection of Gavin Stone is one of those annoying movies that uh, that <clears throat> it's it's a faith based film, but it's one of those faith based films where really the point isn't that the guy uh, you know, finds uh, uh, salvation through going back to church and realizing his heathen, heathenist ways. That's the way they all go. No, but this guy is an actor. Oh. And he gets 200 hours of community See. service. So he has to realize that Hollywood is a cesspool of, of depravity, and he needs to go back to church That's to realize what's real. That's a change, because usually they are baseball, football, basketball players, or uh, golf, golf pros. I mean, this usually is, they're athletes. I mean, this thing is just like... Let's spend 90 minutes just proving to you that Hollywood is just a heathenist cauldron and just a pit from hell. And then if you can just find God, everything will be fine, and then Hollywood will go away. Well, there we go. That's, so uh, that's what it is. So if you like that kind of crap, then uh, it's true. Uh, Mind Gamers is um, – I, 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 I skimmed this. It's, it's, it actually, it's, it's a little bit like The Circle, which is um, – it's, it, 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 it's a cautionary tale that feels like a, a, a B-movie. In the film, there's this new – <clears throat> There's this new computer capability where people can actually transfer their their uh, motor skills, yeah, and their abilities to other people. Like, <clears throat> like for instance, if you were a great uh, pole vaulter, our minds can link, and then you can make me a great pole vaulter. I can have your motor skills, and so of course, it's uh, all these motor skills. They are uh, connected via a quantum computer. Oh. So you know it's like a bad episode of Star Trek The Next Generation because it's a quantum computer. I see. And of course, what happens is that it all goes bad. And then Sam Neill's got to help figure it out. Okay. Because he's Sam Neill, and we love him. So Mind Gamers is basically, this feels like a second-tier sci-fi film. A film for, I mean, a film for sci-fi yeah. channel. A second-tier sci-fi channel film. That's what this feels like to me. Oh, uh, well. 
And uh, then very, very last bit here, we've got one from Wolf, which uh, specializes in uh, LGBT material. And uh, very interestingly, they, they are not playing up the, uh, the gay angle of this because it is uh, actually quite an interesting crossover drama. Got a lot of, uh, you know, they, they just don't want it to be marginalized as something specifically for a very, very specific uh, audience. And I think that's interesting marketing, but um, I don't think they had to do that. In any case, uh, Counting for Thunder from first-time director Philip Irwin Cooper. It's basically, and they cop right to this, it's basically like uh, Terms of Endearment only with a son instead of a daughter. And uh, Marriott Hartley plays the mom. John Hurd is in this as well. Marriott John Hurd John Hurd makes everything better. You know that? He's just such he a does. good actor. Cool. It's amazing. He's done this for decades. Um, anyway, Marriott Hartley's the mom. And in this case, the, uh, the, you know, the health crisis, as it were, uh, it hits her, and uh, as opposed to the son. But otherwise, it's a it, you know it pushes a lot of the same buttons. And um, you know Philip Irwin Cooper has some chops. He does well with the actors, and it's a, it's a neat little script. So, Counting for Thunder, it's worth paying attention to. All right, Mark, uh, look at the swag we got this week. We, we well last week you you weren't here, but I want to show you these sunglasses with eye protection, ultraviolet eye protection. I dare you to wear purple Swan Princess uh, sunglasses. You know, in actually, public. that's that, that's a problem with sunglasses. Well, because well, here's what you do. Yeah. You you put on a pair of sunglasses and you're right. So your yeah. your your sure. your pupils open up. Of course. Right. Yeah. So if your pupils open up and you don't have UV protection. Right. Now, like your your sun is your eyes being blasted by sunburned. By, your eyes are being your, like your retina is being yeah. Right, because sunglasses open your pupils up, so you they need do. that UV protection. The, so the fact that these guys would put UV protection on their glasses... Swan Princess sunglasses. ...means that it could be worth it to wear so, Swan Princess sunglasses. So when you wear your Swan Princess sunglasses in Paris, mm -hmm. I want you also to take your to put this uh, uh, Fantastic Beasts name tag on your luggage, and you will be the hit of Paris, because you are walking over there with film critic swag. You know what? I, I, I never saw this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw it. I did Tim, not see Tim and I talked about it. Tim and I talked about Are it. We good? spared you. And by the way, we also spared you having to sit here and uh, endure me going, a la la land. Oh, it's so wonderful. Oh, because the Blu-ray came out. The Blu-ray came out. By the way, you know, Tuesday was La La Land Day in Los Angeles. Did you know that? Yeah, you know what? I, I, did you I was, pay attention to what they did downtown? No, what they do. <laughs> you can see all this online. So first of all, the, the the there's a lala fan lala land a lala fan dot movie site which is where um, people send videos of themselves performing music from La La Land and some of it's really amazing like there's this 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 couple that does this whole acapella uh, medley of songs from La La Land it's really amazing and then there uh, there's a couple that went up to Griffith Park and reenacted that entire scene lovely night they do the entire song the entire scene every bit of the choreography and the dancing exactly as it is in the movie. It's uncanny. Yeah, well, you know what? It's terrifying. Because Ryan Gosling is such a bad dancer and they had to simplify no. all the moves for him. <laughs> it's pretty, okay. Many non-dancers many non can do that move. But they, then there was also a big event downtown LA in front of City Hall where they had these dancers on, uh, on tethers who performed dance moves horizontally against the edge of LA City Hall. To, I mean, it was like, it was, you know, coming down on cables. Right. And oh. then at the end of it all, at the end of it all, yeah. Uh, you know, you could you could tell that that uh, it, it, there was a, there was a slight embarrassment factor there for Damien Chazelle and for Justin Hurwitz because they're sort of like, okay, we, we're we're glad you like our movie, but oh my gosh, really seriously, you know, the, it's it's a well the the last bit of it was the mayor of Los Angeles sits down at a piano and starts playing La La Land music with like a four piece jazz backup. I didn't know he played piano. I didn't either. That's crazy. It's hysterical. Was he good? He, not bad. Not bad. He clearly rehearsed for a little bit. You know, he's not like a professional musician, but it was a little bit of a weird moment. Wow. <laughs> it laying the groundwork for re-election. I, I heard that. Uh, I heard that Chazelle's new film. He's pitching a film that takes place in Paris. Oh, really? Yes. That's nice. I heard that. Well, his next film is the uh, is the uh, Neil Armstrong biopic with yeah. uh, with Gosling playing Armstrong, and I'm not quite sure how I feel about that, but I love La La Land enough that I will give them the benefit of the doubt. Do whatever he wants. All right, uh, let's just let's do the the, the concerty uh, musicy stuff. Let's get that out of the way. We got a lot of uh, uh, archival classic movie stuff to to pile into, so um, try to try to get to that before the end of the show. But what do we got music wise? 
Uh, oh, we, actually, well, you know what? Let me let, here talk about talk about baseball first, and then we'll we'll. God, do the, the Mets—they right just effing <laughs> suck. <laughs> you know, we got up to a fast start. Like, okay, we're rolling now. We've got our, we've got our. The great good pitchers. times never last, do they? And then I think I think we were like like two for the last eleven or something. Yeah. Um, and now we just suck so hard. Yeah. I I just I mean, luckily I'm so consumed by Colcoa, and I was in Paris, and my girlfriend was here yeah. that I haven't really drilled down yeah. as much as I normally would. But uh, yeah, we're terrible. What's not terrible is this Blu-ray that you really should get. It's a uh, World Series, uh, the complete game seven of the um, Cub series, the uh, game seven. And uh, it was a great, great game. It was one of the best single it World really Series was. games ever. It was so dramatic. I even tuned in at a certain point. I was like, I got to watch this. It was so dramatic. <laughs> I got to watch I this. I just, it was amazing. Uh, you know, and then they had the rain delay, which made things even even crazier. Like, what's going to happen during the rain delay? Um, so, yeah, so this is, and obviously baseball knows that this game was really off the charts. So this is the Cubs and the Indians game seven. The Blu-ray is only this game, and it's two discs. Um, this, too, is, you know, highlights from the Cubs throughout the whole postseason. And then uh, footage from the parade, and so I have to say that if you love baseball, obviously the Cubs Cubs fans will get this anyway. But if you're a fan of baseball, I I would completely recommend this. I think that game was just completely unforgettable. It was great. So World Series complete game seven, go for it. All right, and then uh, we've got Tupac assassination battle for Compton on Blu-ray. You know, can can we can we stop trying to beatify uh, uh, Tupac? I mean, well, it's funny how like he was like this rapper, you know, and then and then he dies and he becomes like a thug angel. Yeah, <laughs> he's a know. thug angel. Okay, poor baby. I don't thug know. Thug angel. Yeah, I don't know if he's. I don't know if we're beatifying him quite so much. It's it's more the contradiction between the man and his work. All right. So anyway, uh, yeah, T- Tupac assassination battle for Compton um, is 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 part of the um, it's part of a series. Looking at you know the the uh, the issues surrounding his killing basically, and it's uh, it, it, it's of interest probably only if you're really really a diehard Tupac person. Um, if you're into the whole conspiracy theory that you know his killing and Biggie and all that that there was this whole East West thing going on, if if, if that is of interest to you, then this will be of interest. Uh, Lots of interviews here with, uh, you know, prosecutors and uh, police and law enforcement and witnesses and people who knew this and that and the other thing. So, I mean, it's uh, it's less about the music than the man. And that, I think, is kind of the weakness of it. But if that's your deal, you know, you're not really going to care. Mm-hmm. You're going to you're going to want to further that. Mm-hmm. Um, on a brighter note, we have the John Williams Steven Spielberg Ultimate Collection. And uh, this is pretty great. It's uh, it's a CD set. It's three CDs and a DVD. And the DVD uh, includes the documentary uh, Steven Spielberg and John Williams: The Adventure Continues, which is a Laurent Bouzereau documentary, which is perfectly fine. Uh, it's it's not amazing. It's not brilliant. Although Bouzereau's, you know, what is brilliant is Bouzereau's, you know, because Bouzereau does a lot of uh, featurettes yeah, for DVDs, right? Sure. He's, like, he's like he's like our friend Charles. Yep. Uh, he does all that uh, all that documentary stuff. But he his um, his five came back documentary is amazing. Oh, which you know what? I've not seen yet. Oh my gosh, that's really? his masterpiece. Wow. Because you're like, okay, this guy does featurettes and behind the scenes things. Okay, fine, fair enough. And then five came back. You watch that and you go, this is a great doc. This is amazing. Huh. Like this is stop doing all that other stuff and just do this. Be be like a feature doc guy. Huh. That's what you should do. It's really amazing. I've not seen it. Oh wow, it's fantastic. well. I really want to, but I just haven't. It's great. Because I'm too busy watching French films. Yeah, you know what else is great is uh, the 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 Great War, the PBS thing on World War One. Oh yeah, it's really good. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, anyway, this is uh, uh, the Spielberg Williams collaboration. The and the CDs are you know everything that you would want. It's all new performances, new recordings, but it's you know it's all the great themes and all the great suites that you you want. E.T. and Schindler's List and you know Hook on and on and on. I mean it's great. It's it's just terrific and it's all it's just a wonderful. If if you don't know what's coming next, it's great. The music all kind of flows and it brings back memories of the music. It's a lot of fun. Lot and you of know fun. what? Now now that uh, Spielberg has officially n- is not using John Williams for all of his films anymore. Well, I mean, he just did because Williams was working on something else or he was sick. I can't remember I what it was. I don't know, but it makes me sad. Yeah, that's all I can tell you. And then lastly, on the music front, we are X. 
this is um, the, this, the the people who made this are the guys who did the Academy Award winner uh, Searching for Sugar Man, uh, which won an Oscar back in 2012. So it is extremely well done. However, uh, I I uh, don't really get into the music here. So it you know X Japan is the uh, is the band. And uh, it's not my kind of deal. So um, if you like it, I guess, you know, uh, let that be your guide. This was, you know, they threw this at South by Southwest and people liked it there because, you know, it's music and movies and the festivals are back to back, the music and the movie festival down there. But anyway, we are X. So well done. But I mean, you know, X Japan, not my not my scene. Uh, what is my scene is the salesman. Oh, yeah. Which is uh, directed by uh, the great Asghar Farhadi. We do like him very much. Very, very much. He's and now a two-time Oscar winner. That's right. And uh, this is about a couple, a young couple. Uh, they are um, when they're living in Toronto. When their apartment becomes, uh, the apartment gets damaged. They have to move out. They move into a new apartment. And then once they're relocated, they realize that the previous tenant, right, of their new apartment, yes. is a little, uh, little. Uh, uh, Past a little history of violence with that previous yep. tenant of the yep. apartment they're now living in, uh-huh. and how it uh, how that whole thing kind of creates a lot of tension between the husband and the wife. That's all I will tell you because I think this thing is great. I think he is great, and you know the the, the way that he just can. There's like this the way that he combines character and conflict is just great. Like everything is done with character. Like when this a, a little piece of conflict comes, how does it affect the marriage? It's all about how it affects the marriage, how it affects the relationship. It's you know, it's it's. I thought it was just exquisite. It's really good. And, and the thing is that it's ultimately kind of a bit of a suspense thriller, but it's not like, you know, it's not like a Death Wish film or anything like that. It's just it's just a, it's a over. It's just very intense, but kind of quiet. It's it's. I, I just thought it was great. You know, I just think he. Uh, I think this guy has just got it, and I can't wait till he comes to America and does a, 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 a an, an Avengers film. <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen. And a few other foreign language films this week uh, of worth mentioning is uh, a Korean film called The Tunnel. Actually, just called Tunnel. There's no the on it. Uh, and there are a lot of movies with Tunnel or The Tunnel as their title. Uh, so make sure that if you're going to look this one up, you're, this is the Korean one. Um, this is about a guy who uh, a tunnel collapses on him. And kind of in uh, World Trade Center, was that the, the, that's the Oliver Stone film, kind of in a World Trade Center way. And then you, uh, you know, the film basically focuses on the, uh, the, on his survival ordeal and what they're doing to rescue him and so forth and so on. Um, and it's, uh, it's claustrophobic, but it's not obviously kind of self-indulgently claustrophobic. It's not like Ryan Reynolds trapped in a coffin or, you know. Uh, any of that? It really, actually, it, it makes um, it. It works the it works the angle of its conceit uh, in a way that you don't feel like it's gimmicky. So uh, that's tunnel. And then we also have a Turkish film here, Nasiya, N A C I Y E. I'm sure I didn't pronounce that as the way it's supposed to be pronounced. Um, but anyway, this is a uh, this is a thriller that goes into some kind of creepy horror-ish areas. It's uh, the kind of film you would expect to be an American horror film, really. Uh, you know, it's a it's a couple who go out into the middle of nowhere for this to occupy this uh, this remote rented house uh, because she's pregnant and they want to go somewhere where um, you know the, where the, the the last trimester can sort of be uh, tranquil. Now, if that doesn't sound like a recipe for just oh yeah, let's go let's go move next door to a serial killer for our uh, for the you know so our child can be born. I mean, it just it feels a little bit uh, obvious, but there are people out there who like that kind of stuff. So whatever, it's a Turkish film, which makes it a little even creepier for some reason. And then uh, from Cinema Libre, the girl from the brothel uh, is actually quite a good film. This is in English and Khmer. Uh, this is about a uh, photographer, a woman photographer, who goes to Cambodia to um, kind of uh, try to um, uh, surprise, but also patch things up with her husband. And uh, they, you know, she wants to. They, they have some issues. I won't get into what those issues are, but they they want to do a thing. And anyway, um, 
the trip to Cambodia doesn't turn out quite as pastoral as she might expect. Uh, things happen, and she has to make some crucial decisions in her life, and yada, 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 on and on and on. And then Cambodia winds up becoming a, um, a metaphor for, I mean, I'm being really circumspect because I don't want to give anything away, becomes sort of a metaphor for this new journey in her life. So in any case, uh, The Girl from the Brothel has some really, really powerful stuff in it. Uh, it's, um, it this, is, this did not get a theatrical release here. It's played all kinds of festivals. It has, it's, it's a little bit of a difficult sell on a number of levels, but I do recommend it. You know what I recommend? Yeah. Staying alive. <gasps> Don't die. Stay alive. Now here's the thing with the Saturday Night Fever director's cut. This is, uh, this is the real deal, man. This is a new 4K restoration. John it's Adams. A, but it's a Blu-ray. It's a 4K restoration, but it's a Blu-ray. Yeah, it's a Blu-ray. It's, yeah. not, it's, it's not a 4K Blu-ray, but it's a yeah. 4K restoration yeah. completed under the supervision of John Badham. So this is not just uh, your normal uh, blam blam. This is like, uh, this might be worth an upgrade, folks. If you don't have Saturday Night Fever, first of all, shame on you. Second of all, Wade's going to give me this. Oh, no, no, no. i gotta, I got to introduce my daughter to uh, some Travolta-ness. <laughs> so she this hasn't is experienced the, uh, Travolta yet. She's been into Sound of Music last week, so we gotta, we got to BG it up this week. Now, luckily, um, we have the director's cut and the theatrical cut. So if, yeah. you, if you don't really like what Badham did to this thing, uh, you can have the original cut, which is a good thing. There's an audio commentary by Badham on the theatrical version um, and a bunch of new and old uh, featurettes. If you don't know, ask your parents. But uh, Saturday Night Fever was a complete phenomenon at the time. And I remember – this is the 40th anniversary, by the way. I remember when uh, my father was hanging out with his best friend, who was a real bell-bottom disco guy, and he came home with his Saturday Night Fever soundtrack on record – and they played that thing into the ground. Yeah. It was just crazy. So, uh, yeah, this is Travolta and uh, Karen Gorney. What happened to her? Uh, wah, wah, Karen Gorney. And uh, John Badham directed. John Badham directed a couple of really good films back then. People don't realize. He did War Games and Blue Thunder the same summer. Yes. The same summer. Isn't that crazy? Love it. Sweet. Those. Anyway, uh, recommended. And uh, then the last of our uh, – well, th we're, we're now into um, – uh, classic movies, and I'm going to blow through some huge ones right here, but the, the, the last of these kind of one-offs here is uh, from, from Mill Creek, Space Hunter Adventures in the Forbidden Zone on Blu-ray. Not a, a 3D Blu-ray, I would point out, even though this movie was released in 3D, so that remains, t that, that is, this is directed by Lamont Johnson, who was a big TV director at the time. Don't, not sure why they had him do this. Um, this was kind of one of those uh, Mad Max knockoffs. It was like a sci-fi film on another planet, but it was very Mad Maxy, and uh, took a lot of its cues. You know, here's the thing about Space Hunter Adventures in the Forbidden Zone. When I first got my job as an usher at a theater right out of high school, first year at UCLA, worked in the Man's National, this is the film that was playing. For one more week, the last week of this thing's run, before Twilight Zone the movie opened, that's what I endured with Space Hunter. This thing is so hilariously terrible. And the classic bit here is is that early on in the film where the, you have the model spaceship kind of crash landing thing, if you look in the background, you can see the parking lot where they actually set up the miniature. Oh. You can see that on screen. It's pretty awesome. Richard Strauss, by the way, he's the guy you got if you couldn't get Richard Chamberlain. That's true. So if you're doing uh, a big movie and you can't get Chamberlain, you're pretty bad. And Molly Ringwald was uh, just trying to sort of become a thing at this time and would go on to a much better career, obviously, with, uh, with uh, John Hughes movies. But in any case, uh, yeah, Michael Ironside, by the way, plays Overdog. So if you don't recognize the scary, badass, psycho dude who plays the Mad Maxi kind of villain in Overdog? this thing. Overdog? Yeah, it's, it's Michael Ironside. Ernie Hudson's in this, too, before, like pre-Ghostbusters. Pre it's a lot of fun. There's, there's, there's this funny... And by a lot of fun, I mean not really fun. There's this funny recurring bit in, in Guardians of the Galaxy where one of the villains' name is Taserface, right? Yeah. So he always says his name as if, like, you will feel the wrath of Taserface. <laughs> and everybody laughs because his name is so stupid, and he doesn't realize it. It's funny. So we got some 4K. <laughs> we got some 4Ks this week too. Uh, real quickly, uh, four, 310 to Yuma, the remake with uh, Russell Crowe and Christian Bale, uh, is is out on 4K. I I. How did you feel about this? I'm just curious. Oh, I loved it. Did you it's love great. this? Yes. I like it, but first of all, it was uh, it was. Um, is it better than the original? It was Ben. Oh, pff, yes, it was. It was, it was <laughs> okay. First of all, it was Ben Foster's. Uh, it was it was it was his coming out party. Yeah, he was great. True, he is. It was great also man. It. I mean, his thing. Mangold had had Copland, 
Yeah. Right? And then he, he hasn't done little, anything since. He was a little bit in the in, in, in the wilderness, right? And yeah. then he does three ten of you and you're like, oh my god, this guy's whoa. Well, what's he done way. since? Huh? What's he done since? Yeah, he goes a bunch of, he does a, a, a But I mean good. What's he done of like you Logan? know really good? I like Logan. You oh he did Logan? do Logan, didn't he? Yeah. yeah I haven't seen good. Logan yet. I haven't good. seen Logan yet. Good. Violent as hell, man. That thing is violent. So I take it back. You made Logan. All right. Uh, anyway, three ten to Yuma. I still, I still, uh, I still struggle with this movie a little bit. I'm not sure why. It's got great suspense, but maybe I'm too attached to the original. Anyway, 4K Ultra HD. Uh, heaps and heaps and heaps of stuff on here. Featurettes galore, and an audio commentary with Mangold. And I will say, as a 4K, it's really good looking. The Expendables one and two. I don't know that these really need to be on 4K, but they are now. Uh, and they also have uh, heaps of stuff on here. Audio commentary with Simon West. Uh, audio commentary with Sylvester Stallone. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm effect- I, the third one is terrible. Okay, the third one is just horrendous. Um, I am fond of The Expendables 2 only because Chuck Norris makes one of the all-time great entrances in the history of movies, <laughs> which is just, it just makes the whole thing worthwhile. Um, it's still rather silly, but uh, you know what? Stallone found a late career resurgence with this franchise, and you gotta sort of tip your hat to him for doing it. He's in Guardians, also. Stallone is for like five seconds. He really? literally is in it for one scene. You're like, what is he doing in this film? But like Marvel, I would imagine he probably shows up in one of the later films. But I, I don't know that. All right, Mark. Here we go. We're uh, speed round. We're getting near the end of the show. So speed round. Uh, first off, Kino Lorber. And I'm going to get you, you can take a load off because Wade's just going to burn through these things super Yay! fast. Kino Lorber, Studio Classics. Unbelievable bunch of titles this month. Uh, really, this is just great stuff. Uh, this is occasionally, sometimes, you know, there's, there's sort of uh, a, a film in there or two that where you go, well, somebody just needed to sort of get it out. But no, this stuff is all really, really worth checking out. This is a great bunch of movies. Uh, the Anthony Simmons directed 1973 film. The Optimists with Peter Sellers, where Sellers plays this uh, this fascinating kind of uh, Pied Piper-like street performer. Uh, it's a, just a really, really an interesting film, really one of the more interesting films from the early 70s. And uh, Anthony Simmons really never had much of a career, uh, but this is a very interesting film. Produced, I should point out, by uh, George Martin. It was kind of, it came out of the whole Beatles movie moment. And speaking of Pied Piper, that brings us to a film that has uh, also similar sensibilities from the previous year, The Pied Piper uh, from 1972, a delightful film directed by none other than a man who is one of the direct insp- inspirations for La La Land, Jacques Demy. Uh, and Jacques Demy did the, the, just does a wonderful job with this. Now, there's a, a, an older Pied Piper movie starring Van Johnson, which I grew up with, which is... Okay, it's fine. Uh, has a certain kind of Hollywood uh, golden era sheen to it, but uh, the Jacques Demy film is way, way better. It really captures the magic of the story of the Pied Piper of Hamlin. Great art direction. Uh, Donald Pleasance is just fantastic in this. Uh, Jack Wilde, who had just done uh, Oliver, the Oscar-winning Oliver, a few years earlier, is just uh, incomparable. And then on top of it, you get, look, John Hurt and Donovan. It is a great movie. Uh, back when Paramount made... Terrific movies in the 1970s. I mean, this is not, you know, this is 1972. This is the same year as The Godfather. Paramount made the, the, the Pied Piper and Godfather in the same year. Those daring young men in their jaunty jalopies with Tony Curtis and Peter Cook and Dudley Moore uh, is delightful. Ken Anakin, uh, you know, made the, the, a kind of a franchise out of the daring young men and their flying machines and their jaunty jalopies. It was a momentary uh, franchise, and uh, it's a lot of fun. It's an awful lot of fun. And with Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, uh, who were at their peak, and Tony Curtis, of course, who was doing all kinds of stuff like this uh, roughly around this time, this is, it's just fantastic. It's absolutely a delight. So uh, I cannot recommend this uh, highly enough. Um, it is, uh, it, it's a, there's a typo on the uh, packaging of this, though, I should point out. The movie was made in 1969. They indicate 1945. Not a, not true. Somebody mistyped something. But uh, anyway, so I mean, if you like if you like Moore and Cook, if you like uh, you know uh, flying machines, uh, the young man are flying machines. If you like um, Tony Curtis and the Great Race, it all comes together here, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, and then uh, Jackie Gleason and Papa's Delicate Condition. All I should have said is just this is a Jackie Gleason movie, and that should be enough for you. Uh, it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And um, 
It's a little bit like um, Life with Father, only with Jackie Gleason swapped in. This is from 1963, and uh, it, it's one of the best things that Jackie Gleason ever did. It really is. It's, it's just a sheer delight and a tremendous cast. And Glynis Johns, who was uh, so delightful in um, uh, Mary Poppins a few years later, is also just uh, deli- wonderful in it. A Jerry Lewis movie, Don't Give Up the Ship. This is one of Jerry Lewis's lesser-known films from 1959, before his uh, his really, really, you know, his very best stuff really took off in the 60s. Uh, and uh, but this is great. I mean, it's it's still incredibly funny. Directed by Norman Tarag, who directed a lot of his best stuff. And this is a new master from a 4K scan, and uh, it's great. I mean, the whole thing is, uh, you know, there's, it's just it kind of just after World War II, and every, there's an investig- a Senate investigation uh, that Jerry is central to, and uh, it's, you know, he's on his honeymoon, and it, it just gets wacky and funny and silly, and, uh, you know, you, it's just sympathetic. Jerry's the best. Uh, one of the first movies I ever saw on television is this movie. James Stewart in Broken Arrow. You ever seen Broken Arrow? If I have, I don't remember. It's it's really actually I remember it so well just because you know it it captivated me when I was I don't know four years old. I must have been four watching television. Uh, but it's a it's you know when they would show westerns like Saturday afternoons. This is from 1950, and uh, it's it's just one of those great Jimmy Stewart westerns. Uh, you know he's a, he's just right after the war, the Civil War, a few years after the Civil War. And he's fighting Apaches, and uh, you know it just it hits all of those those great Western archetypes from that era. So this is uh, and it's a good looking uh, Blu-ray as well, Broken Arrow. And then lastly, Ernest Hemingway's Farewell to Arms, with Rock Hudson and Jennifer Jones and uh, Vittorio De Sica in a rare acting role, the uh, great director. This was a Selznick production from 1957. And uh, it still is one of the best adaptations ever of an Ernest Hemingway novel. Uh, it's been on DVD and various public domain versions for years. And this is finally an authorized Blu-ray of it, and it really, really does look very, very good. It's a 4K restoration. Uh, they went to town. They really, really uh, tuned everything up. The colors are rich. It's, it's, it's really saturated. And uh, Charles Vidor... Uh, not to be confused with King Vidor, does a, an outstanding job really kind of maintaining the story but giving it a classic Hollywood golden era sheen. So that's terrific. That's all we have from the Kino Lorber Studio Classics. And then we have from uh, Twilight Time, Mark. We've got some Twilight Time. Yay, we like them. Love Twilight Time as well. You can go to twilighttimemovies.com to find these. Uh, we've got the Fortune Cookie, Jack Lemon, Walter Matthau, Billy Wilder. Love it. It's great, isn't it? How can you not? How can you not? What I a mean, great pickup for Twilight. Time. Oh, fantastic! Uh, I, I just this is one of the the better Billy Wilder, uh, Izzy Diamond movies from their collaboration. Uh, it's it's just a little overlooked actually, because when you think of them, is. you think of other well, films. You, think yeah, of, you think of uh, like it, uh, some like it hot, hot yeah. right? But this to me is every bit the equal of some like it hot. I I really think it's a this is a great movie. Um, it just it came. At a time when Billy Wilder was sort of not so much a thing anymore, right? Late 60s, 1966, we're sort of moving away from the Billy Wilder moment. And uh, And he comes back and does it. And he comes back and does it. does a beautiful job. Uh, You know, Jack Lemmon's TV cameraman who who suffers a certain injury. And then there's this whole... um, insurance scam that happens and it's uh it's really great it's just really really great if you haven't seen it you need to see this you need to add this to your your billy wilder compendium uh and then of course twilight time has been doing a a lot of work with the uh, the old woody allen catalog and uh here's one of his uh better dramas another woman which is i think i think this ages really really well uh the cast is so amazing and now that some of these people aren't really in movies anymore, you kind of look back on this and you go, wow, wh- I wish those people would make a movie again. Uh, I mean, here, here's your cast, okay? Martha Plimpton, that's as bad as it gets. Sandy Dennis, oh. Blythe Danner, oh. Mia Farrow, oh. Gene Hackman, oh. Ian Holm, oh. John Hausman, oh. Jenna Rollins. Come on! Well, that's because people would do anything to work with Woody. Any, that's amazing! Work with Woody. That's an amazing cast. Of course it is. It's an amazing cast. That alone, uh, isolated music track, as they have on all of these, 
these Twilight Time titles is is also wonderful. Um, this is another film that is often overlooked, which I just absolutely adore. Directed by William Wyler, How to Steal a Million. Peter O'Toole, Audrey Hepburn, William Wyler. I shouldn't have to say anything else. That is just absolutely fantastic. That look, you, look, how, look at Peter O'Toole. Right? He's young. so handsome and rakish. Oh, so awesome. Uh, this is a wonderful comedy. This is from 1966, just on the cusp of William Wyler going and doing Funny Girl with uh, Barbara Streisand. And you can tell that he's sort of exercising those same muscles. He's getting into... He's getting into a different vein. You know, Wyler was always a guy who, I mean, he made a lot of different kinds of movies, but you look back, it's like Ben-Hur and Detective Story and The Best Years of Our Lives. I mean, Mrs. Miniver, heavier movies, right? Typically heavier movies. He's getting into a really, he's getting the 60s thing. He's getting into that frothy 60s moment. And um, it's just wonderful. It's really, really wonderful. And Hugh Griffith, who he directed to an Oscar in Ben-Hur, is in this as well. Plays a, a forger, who uh, the father of uh, Audrey Hepburn. It's really, it's a lot of fun. It's it's just a delightful movie. How to Steal a Million. And then, uh, lastly, from Twilight Time, You'll Never Be Rich, which is also sheer and complete and utter and total delight. Fred Astaire and Rita Hayworth. Uh, it's Hollywood golden era magic. Isolated music and effects track and a trailer are the only extras on here, but this is just 1940s filmmaking with uh, no equal, fantastic Cole Porter music, uh, just beautifully done, classic studio era machine factory stuff. It's, uh, the, li- the dialogue is snappy. Uh, it's just wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. It, it, you know, if, you want, if you just want to see these two stars at their very best, you'll never get rich. And uh, I, of course, still have a real affection for Rita Hayworth just because... Oh, she was so hot. There's our family connection, you know. My father knew her. My father taught her. She was hot. And her dad was my father's uh, dancing instructor at his school. So did your father meet to Orson Welles? I'm sure he did. Never mentioned it. Never talked about it. I mean, he, you know, Laurel and Hardy, yes. Uh, lots of other figures. Never, never. Orson Welles. I'm not sure that my father was really connected to the Hayworths once she was at that stage. Uh, you know, it's more than 1930s when she was a little girl, a teenager. That's my father knew her. So hot. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then I want to wrap things up here. I know we're, we're over time, so I'll just real quickly. Uh, Mark, how do you feel about Donnie Darko? Uh, you know, I, 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 I've, I've, um, I've softened on it. Have you? I was one of those guys that like, you know, this thing is just weird. You, will you just please stop being weird and just tell me a story? So from the Arrow Video line, Arrow Video has gone completely over the, uh, the edge here. They have given us the Donnie Darko monster big cheese mega set like I've never seen. I have almost never seen a single film get a special treatment like this. This rivals Criterion. This thing is a monster. Uh, This is the Donnie Darko director's cut, the theatrical cut. Uh, The the movie does not deserve all this. I mean, mean, this is this is insane. This is a this thing weighs like five pounds. I mean, Richard Kelly. It's a brick. Richard Kelly, as a director, has done nothing since this film. Southland Tales was Horrible. Yeah. The box, horrible. It's just horrible. I, I, you know what it is? It, the only thing I'll say about Donnie Darko is that it's, it, as, as weird as it is, it's nice to see, I guess, a young filmmaker just take a huge, huge shot like that. Yeah. Right? Which was, was a little unusual for the time. Nowadays, you know, everybody kind of, it's a little bit more cool to do that. Uh, but I guess I'd rather have him try and fail than not try. So it is, I'll say this. Uh, independent of Richard Kelly, who I have very mixed feelings about, I think this is the best work Stephen Poster has ever done as a cinematographer. I'm very partial to Stephen Poster because we sat with him once during a Lafka dinner, and he and my wife just had, you know, because she was doing a lot of post-production supervision at the time, and they had all kinds of chats about this and that and the other thing. And he's a wonderful man. And I think he just kills it. This is an amazing job of cinematography by any measure. He is one of the best, and this proves it. But I, you know what? You really have to love this movie to get this brick. Uh, this thing has so many special features on it, so many extras. If you watch the movie and then the director's cut, I mean, if you watch every cut of this film and then all the extras, uh, it'll be like, it'll be like, we'll, we'll have, it'll be President Ivanka Trump by the time that, that you're done with it. <laughs> it's just, it is, this thing is, I mean, this is strictly fan stuff. And uh, that is uh, that is quite a number from Arrow. So they really, uh, they did a number with that. In any case. All right, so that's it. That's it for this week. Uh, we will be back next week with more fun and frolic. And Mark, uh, we st- we've never had a sign-off, have we? 
Never no, had a sign. Just, we, you, you just press space bar on your laptop, and then the show is over. There we go.